Okay, so let's talk about the last third of this epic 100 line travel biographical poem by Dufu. The first two videos about this poem has taken us two thirds in as far as this couplet and uh, he has started off by describing himself autobiographically or at least his ambitions who is he and then he describes as he sets out from Chang'an in the middle of the night the winter is cold and he passes by the Emperor's palace by Li Shang, where he spends the waters in the where he spends the winters in the vicinity of the hot springs located there. And there he muses and reflects with bitterness and acrimony on the great moral confusion and corruption in the empire and especially within the imperial household. And now he moves on on his way. Bei Yuan Jiu Jing Wei Guan Du Yu Gai Zhe. Language wise, this is perhaps a little bit difficult to understand. Jing Wei, the Jing and the Wei are of course, rivers close to Chang'an, which is familiar for the people who who listen to this, I am sure. Bei Yuan, my northward cart, is Owen's translations. To get to Fengxian from Chang'an, Du Fu is on his way, of course, to a place called Fengxian, as we know, to the know in the title. To get to this place from Chang'an, it is necessary to cross the Wei River. This river, the way. Yuan, this is a forward facing part of the carriage. So here it's used metonymically for his carriage. So we know that Dufu now he's, he's traveling in a carriage and he reaches the river and he has to take a ferry at the Guandu, the official crossing. Um, it seems actually, for my edition, um, it seems that this crossing moved about somewhat, perhaps according to the conditions at different times of the year. And this Gaizhe changed track, the, the official crossing has, has changed track again. That may refer to that. So he, is, after he has been traveling northward, he comes to the place where the Jing and Wei meet and he has to cross the river. And now he finds that the official crossing has has changed the track again. Um, so he has arrived here on to the river on carriage, but now he has to cr cross uh, on a ferry, and he will continue uh, on foot, I think. What does he see then at the official crossing? Chunbing Tong Xia Ji Mu. Gao Zu Wu Chun Bing Great masses of ice are coming down from the west so the, the Wei River and the Jing River they both go from the west to the east mm. As far as the eye can see they are high and how high? Zu Wu is the word he uses to describe that. This is another of these mountain descriptors. The Chinese language is full of endless mountain descriptors. There are probably hundreds of these two character compounds that describe high mountains. So the, this here des uh, describes the ice. Perhaps it means that the ice is jagged, uh, large. Of course, it's difficult to imagine that there are like literal icebergs floating on this rel relatively small um, river but this is at least the sort of impression that it makes on Dufu to see this massive 
chunks of ice traveling down the river. And he, he makes a hyperbolic reflection. Yi shi kong tong. Yi shi kong tong lai. Kong chu tian zhu zhe. So this kong tong, kong tong mountains, this is a mountainous area around the source of the Jing River actually. And it flows, uh, you know, the, the Jing River flows into the way, so Kong Tung Mountains lie at the source of the Jing River. Uh, this Kong Tung Mountain, it figures also in the myth of the Yellow Emperor, uh, because the Yellow Emperor Huang Di is said to have received uh, esoteric teaching at that place. And Du Fu, he sort of imagines here that uh, the, the icebergs that have come from the the Kong Tong Mountains, they have broken the pillars of heaven. This is very interesting. Kong Chu Tian Zhu Zhe. I fear that they have struck the pillars of heaven and broken them. This is sort of the feeling he gets from seeing the river full of blocks of ice. And of course, we have to see this in the light of everything that he has said before, his immensely agitated mood and his heightened sense of corruption and danger in the state edifice, which surely is what Tian Zhu Zhe, the pillars of heaven breaking, refers to. Of course, the pillars of heaven, these, this, this term, it features in the myth of how the earth came to tilt eastwards. This is an ancient myth. Of course, as you know, the Chinese landscape, broadly speaking, is higher in the west and lower in the east. And the major rivers run from the west to the east. So, in order to explain this, uh, early ancient Chinese, they, they came up with this myth that there was a huge fight between uh, rival demons and, and gods and the pillars of heaven were broken. Um, which then, then caused the, the tilt of the earth. It caused the earth to tilt from the west to the east. Now, Owen, he has translated this, I feel it would strike and break the pillars of heaven, as if, you know, they might have done that. Um, because they are so large, but I don't read it like that. I, I think it's, he's, he, he says that they have the look of arriving from Kong Tong Mountain and breaking the pillars of heaven there, you know? So his, his sense, his inner sense is that things are already very out of kilter with the empire. And we know this to be the case, right? The war has broken out. Uh, the Tang Dynasty stands on the cusp of an enormous disaster. So this is a very, I think this is a very powerful line and we cannot read it just merely as a description of flows of eyes, even though in the context of this poem that is what they strictly speaking refer to. But even though the pillars of heaven have broken, not everyone is going to perish. He Liang Xing Wei Chai Zhi Cheng Sheng Su Xi. Oh, Xi Su, sorry. Zhi Cheng Sheng Xi Su. So, He Liang, the bridge had not yet collapsed. It's quite strange, isn't it? Um, at first, it, said, it seemed to be a ferry, now it seems to be a bridge. So, what exactly is it here? Anyway, the bridge has not collapsed. The sound of its crossbeams creak and groan. Zhicheng, that's sort of the supports of the bridge. And Xisu is onomatopoeic, um, creaking, rustling. It's quite quite a common common word in Tang Dynasty poetry. It occurs now and then. Xing Lu Xiang Pan Yuan, Tuan Guang Bu Ke Yue. 
Um, so, you know, he's, he is uh, sort of clambering over the bridge together with other travelers, Xingdu, the travelers, all the people, and the, because the river is so, is so wide that it cannot be crossed. It is, I must say, the description here is not, not quite clear. Even if we say that Guandu, the official crossing a few lines before, refers to a bridge, um, here he says that the, the river is so broad that it cannot be crossed, but obviously he is crossing it, right? So, and, and if, there, if it is a bridge, um, why would they need to sort of hold hands to, to get over it? I mean, it, it, is, it is quite strange, this description, I have to say. I, I have a hard time picturing it in, in my mind's eye. But anyway, if we step a bit backwards and we take away the concrete situation and we look at the, the situation of the, the empire at this point, Somehow, I think this becomes just completely logical. It's some. It's as if he, you know, he's himself, you know, departing a bit from the the concrete description of what actually happened when he crossed the river, and he's talking about something else. You know, great flows of ice, as far as we can see. You know that the nature has turned into a wild and and. Uh, hostile place and some force has taken the pillars of heaven that hold the web of the empire together and broken them down but all bridges all possibilities for being saved are not yet exhausted even though when we step on the bridge they creak under our feet but people holding together in faith and love and compassion for each other are perhaps sensing a possibility to cross anyway, even though the river seems overwhelmingly large and powerful. And the river, of course, here being in the world of metaphor, uh, an image of you know the empire in turmoil and a very uncertain future the dufo i think he's being prophetic here no less and now he starts talking about you know himself and his family again so now it suddenly becomes very concrete again lao qi ji yi xian shi kou ge feng xue yeah her, his old wife <laughs> owen charitably enough he doesn't translate old wife as old wife, he just says, my wife. <laughs> Probably his wife was not older than him, himself, and he will say himself only about 40 at this point. She was in an, another county, Yixian, and the Shi Kou, these are the ten, the 10 people of his family, probably perhaps a round number. Uh, they are separated from him by, by winds and snow. This is not difficult language-wise. Um, here we come to a turning point really in the in the poem and which sets everything that we've seen before in a completely different light i think um of course this poem was written after he came home and he had already found out what happened which you can see here and uh, this is really we have to understand what happens in this six lines as the source of the extremely agitated mood that Dufu is in when he writes this poem. What has happened? Well, his infant son has died. He couldn't really go longer without checking on his family. So Shu Wang Gong Ji Ke, he would go. He would go there even though the only thing that he could do there was sharing their hunger and thirst. 
Shu Wang Gong Ji Ke. This Shu, it doesn't really mean uh, it, hope. It's not a verb. It's this is an adverb uh, that means more or less or likely. But strangely enough, you know, when when it is an actual usage, it just frequently veers into the hopeful. So he hope he he thought that he would more or less go and and uh, share their hunger and thirst, share their hardships. It 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 uh, was it, it really does express this nuance of uh, wishing for that. Yeah, crying, wailing. And his young son has died from hunger. <clears throat> and here we have a really interesting couplet, I think. This is really heartbreaking stuff, of course, but this is also interesting in, 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 a, in a cultural, sociological sense. So let's talk about this. Wu Ning Shi Yi Ai Li Xiang Yi Wu Yi. Ning, of course, this means. This is a an interrogative word. Uh, how could I suppress uh, one wail of sadness, one sad, one sorrow? It says really one sorrow. Um, well, why would you suppress your sorrow, Dufu? Right? Uh, there's an there's an interesting answer for this. Um, according to the Li Ji. One does not cry for the death of an infant. This sounds strange, but it really explains it explains the strange expression here, and it gives, I think, a certain pathos to the whole line and the whole couplet here. You know, he is unable to suppress the instincts of his heart, though he knows and believes ritual propriety, according to the rules of the ancients, to be paramount. Um, I think this things like this um, they are a, a very welcome corrective to any too facile understanding of Tang poetry. We must never forget that the people who write these poems, the people who wrote these poems, they were very different from us. Not crying for the death of an infant seems barbaric and strange to us, but it was a rule of propriety for them. And we may observe also that this not crying for an infant, it clearly doesn't apply to women. You know, his wife is wailing and and, and so is the rest of the neighborhood. So this tells us, you know, that Du Fu, he belonged to a class of men, men of education, men of a good name and perhaps of property, who were expected to live up to a higher standard of correct behavior. You know, this was part of their function and their role in society. This is what the class of shi, of gentlemen, were. They were the people who observed the rules of propriety. And you know, the gravitas of a pater familias in ancient China is due to the fact that his very being incarnates responsibility and that this is supposed to be noticeable in all his little actions. So he has another standard of behavior than other people, than l other people his, his, the, the women and the children and the servants and so on and culture you know that culture was about acquiring such habits it's not that you are born a person like that it's about acquiring such habits and being becoming a cultured person and Dufu knows what he's supposed to be doing but here sort of his human heart wins over his um, observance of, of these duties. It's a horrible thing. Can you imagine? I mean, you, you're you going um, to visit your family and you find out that your, your, your young son is dead. Very easy, of course, from a language point of view. So Kui, you know, he's ashamed of himself as a father. The, the thing I was ashamed of, zhi yao zhe, yao zhe, of course, is a word still in, in modern Chinese, to die early. Qi zhi qiu he deng, ping zhi you cang cu. 
Um, I've amended the text of Stephen Owen here. In Stephen Owen says, "Chu Wei Deng," you know, Wei has not, but I think it clearly should be Chu He Deng. This is also the way it's written in in my edition. Chu He, the the autumn grain. Who would have thought that though the autumn grain had matured, um, such calamity would befall our poverty? Yes, our 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 poverty would have such a calamity. Tang Tzu, yes, calamity, referring of his here to the death of the infant. There was food, but to begin with, at least. But now there was not enough to to keep the youngest alive. Now then he shifts attention a bit. He shifts attention from uh, these details of his private life, and this is of course something that um, is very typical of Chinese poetry in general. You don't talk much about family life. I mean, the the kind of uh, disclosure that Du Fu makes here in this poem is actually very rare in Chinese poetry. So. He shifts attention away from that after a few lines, and he starts talking about. He puts this personal disaster in the context of the larger disaster that's unfolding. Sheng Chang Mian Zhu Shui, Ming Bu Li Zheng Fa. He talks about himself. All my life, I've been exempt from taxes. Well, that sounds nice, doesn't it? And truly, because Du Fu belonged to the family of a high official. His grandfather, he was by law exempt from both taxes and military service.、Uh, so his name is not registered for conscription. Bu Li Zheng Fa is not subordinated to Zheng、uh, Zheng Fa. Yes, conscription is exactly the, the right word. Fu Ji You Shan Xin, Ping Ren Gu Sao Xie, and still, you know, it hasn't been easy for me. He says. Fu Ji, considering what bitter things still happen to me, Fu Ji, it literally means touch tracks. It is. It means to think about what has happened to oneself. It's to to add, think about one's history. When I think about my history, it is still very bitter. Sun Xin, ordinary people must be truly desperate. Gu, truly. Sao Xie, Sao Xie is a very funny word, very unusual. It occurs at the earliest point in literature. It occurs as a description of the sound of wind shaking the trees, and this is a very desolate sound. And thus, by association, it means it came to mean desolation, desperation, despondency. And that's what it means here. Pinyin gu sao xie. Mo si shi ye tu, yi nian yuan shu zu. He starts thinking about all these people who had to both pay taxes and who had to go and fight at the frontier. So when it says here, shi ye tu, it's not the jobless exactly. Lost one's livelihood. Yes, I mean that's a very good translation. Shi, of course, in, in Ch modern Chinese, just means jobless. But here, from the earlier two two couplets before, we understand that this means people who have lost their livelihoods because they have to have to pay high taxes and couldn't support themselves. So he, th he thinks about these people and the people who are troops in our far garrisons. You and Shu, far garrisons. Yes. Both of these categories of people are, of course, just common people. So he goes here from his personal tragedy to that of the real, and this will become really a recurring theme in Du Fu. Also, another interesting thing here. I don't know if you have noticed, but he has used this character as a rhyme several times now. Yuan Shu Zu. Here it means soldier. Earlier, we have it here again. Tang Tu, another pronunciation. You could actually write this with the animal character 
animal radical before, but it has a completely different pronunciation. And even earlier, oh, it's not here. We have it in. We have it even earlier in uh, an. Um, in one of the earlier videos I made, he used it in still another, in still another um, sense. So this is a, a character that has many different senses. The last final lines of the poem: "Yu duan qi zhong nan, hong tong bu ke du." Reasons for worry are as great as South Mountain. Qi Zhongnan, South Mountain, the Zhongnan Mountains, the mountain chain close to Chang'an, very high that is. Hong Tong Bu Ke Du. A chaotic swirl is Owen's translation of Hong Tong. Well, Hong, chaotic swirl, Hong Tong, that is, why not? That's a good uh, translation. But it has to be with the distinct association of a cosmic scale just like chaos actually is in in western metaphysics you know that that which is outside of the ordered cosmos or before the creation of the world where nothing has its has its form that is what his worry is like you know it it, it refers to all the things that have been touched upon his personal failures and thwarted ambitions, his worries about the blindness and wastefulness of the ruler, political and parasitic tyranny, the death of his son, his poverty, his compassion for the starving, slaving masses, and this immenseness of, of suffering pushes him to this poetic heights that we see in this in this poem that was the whole poem I've gotten to the end of it and um, to summarize I think again this is such a very good um, poem to read thoroughly and meditate on to understand both Du Fu as a personal, his personal character, his deep poetic inspiration, and also the state of the times that produced such a character. Because there is something in, in um, difficult times that gives birth to extraordinary things. In Swedish there is a poem uh, which which says more or less that uh, man has to bleed so that God may live. Well, there is something to that. Some things are are um, are born of suffering. Some great things are born born of suffering, and Dufu's poems, they, for better or for worse, they belong to this category of things, and. From this point on, uh, when Du Fu starts bearing witness to all the various horrors of the, uh, the eight-year-long Andalusian rebellion, he will really become the poet that he is remembered for. Um, the, his... Uh, his later production is of an extremely even quality and it will be difficult for me to to sort out which poems I will talk about and which not but um, I think from reading at least uh, Dufu's poems in some detail that there is something um, intimately something a very intimate connection between his life and his times and he was, in a way, you know, the perfect expression of the spirit of the Chinese people struggling through these very hard times. So, thank you for listening, if you have listened so far to all of these three videos. And I will make sure that the next one is a bit shorter.
Thank you and bye.